Moving to our final paper speakers, I'd like to invite Dr. Mira Sabaratnam to the floor. Mira is a reader in international relations at SOAS University of London. Her research focuses on the colonial and post-colonial dimensions of world politics, and her book, Decolonizing Intervention, seeks to criticize the current model of development aid. Mira, you have the ears of the house. for coming. Um, it's a delight to speak amongst such august company and um, I'll try not to repeat the points that others have said. In bringing the proposition to a close to say that this house would pay reparations, I'm going to start by acknowledging that con colonialism and the, actually empire itself was enormously complex. It had a large variety of forms, right, from the East India Company formation to the settler colonial project in Australia, from uh, the Royal African Company working in West Africa, from direct rule where it worked and indirect rule where it didn't, from forms of uh, mandate that went from uh, direct rule to the um, trusteeship. We have a whole panoply of governance forms that take place over centuries. And they're innovative and they evolve and they depend on the responses of the local population and how responsive they are to the imperial projects there. But let us not confuse the diversity of projects and the numbers of intermediaries through which they worked from their structural logic, right? The structural logic of empire everywhere, no matter its form, was to render the people, the land, the territories, and the commodities relatively cheap and relatively disposable in order to return the profits to Britain or the metropole in some way. Britain did this, France did this, Belgium tried to get in on the act with less success. But there was a clear structural logic to all of it, and that is why in the 200 years that Britain uh, uh, was the kind of primary imperial power in India, Indian GDP per head was actually pretty constant. It didn't grow very much. Britons grew enormously. Uh, the economist at Sir Naik has calculated the value of the drain from India across 200 years as being at around $45 trillion, right? And that is through uh, labor paid below uh, an uh, appropriate rate. That is through the forms of unequal exchange, paying cheap for the commodities that you have, the invention of taxes that you then have to pay. Then you have to sell yourself into debt bondage in order to play it. So, Yes, slavery may have been abolished, but people were still indentured and effectively bound to work for a particular employer or master until they paid that debt. Uh, it was off. Yes, I'll take that. Is that figure adjusted for inflation or compound economic growth? Because the, the global GDP at that time was less than that much. So this is Pat Nike trying to put a monetary value on things like unequal exchange. So of course the global GDP won't reflect that because it reflects the depressed prices which people are paying for those goods, right? So they're not worth anything. <laughs> but the, the methodology that Pat Nike is using and other people like Hickel are using is trying to find an appropriate estimate for that. Thank you. So this is a clear structural logic and India is one part of the story. And by the way, they are asking for reparations. India is asking for reparations. Pakistan recently, with the devastating floods that cost so much loss of life, asked for reparations for climate change, right? So it's not just a fashionable thing about Africa. So why might we want to pay reparations? This house should pay reparations because we are a society organized by inheritance. We inherit our wealth. We inherit our culture, we inherit our income, we inherit our station in life, we inherit identities. That's not to say we are only what we inherit, but we are so largely what we inherit that the fact of the transatlantic slave trade is still very much felt today. Actually, I was reading today uh, an econ economist who calculated the very clear differentials between, uh, in America, the um, African-Americans who were in the North and therefore freed relatively early compared to those in the South. And there are clear disparities today in their um, access to education and in their income rates. So you see that in America, and I'm sure if you did similar studies elsewhere, you would see that impact today. And we know, of course, that wealth is inherited, and we can see that very clearly from the uh, legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, for example, we, where we just happen to have a ledger with all of the money that was paid out to the slave owners. But we can find other kinds of um, inheritance. Now, the point about the British Empire is that it inherited lots of assets, but it does not want to inherit the liabilities, right? It does not want to inherit the responsibilities. It's happy to hold on to the property and the wealth, 
but then it doesn't want to actually accept the responsibilities that come with it. And like, as the speaker at the back said, if you're going to take pride in things, if you're going to take credit for things, then an appropriate amount of responsibility <coughs> is required. And it is collective, it's not individual, it's not about finding the sp precise necessary descendant, and everybody who's asking for reparations from the governments around the world to campaign groups are not asking for individuals unless they're easily identifiable in the case of, say, Kenyan uh, torture victims. What they're asking for is a collective reparation because of the collective harm, right? Because of the collective responsibility and the collective relative benefit that has been experienced by those countries who did practice colonialism successfully in the recent past. So what are we thinking about here? So the philosopher Olufemi uh, Taiwo uh, has recently written a great book called Reconsidering Reparations, in which he pushes past not just, if you like, a transactional tort law understanding of what reparations are, and that's never really been at the heart of the, the political campaign, but it's not just about direct harm, it's not just about repairing relationships, it's about systemic transformation. And it's saying, what kind of world do we live in because of global racial uh, empire and global racial capitalism? And what kind of world can we live in? How can we change that world? The Benin bronzes is an interesting story. And yes, it's interesting that bronzes were looted um, on a punitive military expedition and then are in museums around the world. It's actually more interesting when you ask the story, why was there a punitive military expedition in the Benin area in 1897. And the reason is because the local elites had the temerity to oppose the monopoly on palm oil being uh, asserted by the Royal Niger Company, which was a royal chartered company, couldn't really deal in slaves anymore in West Africa because that had been abolished. They were looking for other goods, other markets. And the Industrial Revolution, all the machines of Britain, they needed lubricating, they needed oil. And palm oil was your best lubricant. And it turned out that palm oil was really useful for loads of other products. So, of course, the enterprising British go out and they demand a monopoly on the palm oil. And the Crown says, yes, we will, we will back your monopoly and we will punish those who stand in your way. And so they get the monopoly on palm oil. And that um, continues in the Royal Niger Company, eventually becomes the United Africa Company. And that is eventually sold to Unilever, who continue to sell you various palm oil containing products today, who maintained the assets that were gained through that period. Unilever's profits last year, $9 billion, right? How much of that is going to the peoples who were dispossessed, who probably continue to work on palm oil plantations for a very low wage? So what colonialism and the empire has... Yes? So you're tracing through a bias of borders, best interests, land and lease. You're somehow tracing this path of exploitation by an idea. You're somehow protecting that onto the masses, the multitude of British citizens today, whose ancestors invariably were in poverty, had zero political power, zero political voices, certainly no seats in the political boardrooms and the financial boardrooms of Unilever or the Western uh, African countries. So how can you possibly say that we owe a collective debt instead of certain elites from the British starting? How much do you pay for your chocolate? Right? How much do we pay for products that come from a very long way away, which are produced by very poor people who are much worse off than even the poorest in Britain in, in many cases? And we can do that, not because we are individually bad people, but because enormous systems exist which keep that system of unequal exchange in place, right? And this is the point of my speech. So I'm running out of time, so I'm going to cut forward to asking, can we change this system of unequal exchange in a reparative spirit? And this is what reparations means, really fundamentally. Can we change this system where people and planet are made disposable, where we've normalized the violent extraction of uh, goods across distances as the way in which to organize our world and our economies? What kind of other world is possible? Well, we can start with some of the demands that have been made for debt cancellation, for the construction, the urgent construction of a green infrastructure in terms of energy. We can think about the intellectual property regimes that mean that even though India can manufacture vaccines for wealthy uh, pharmaceutical companies of the North, they can't actually vaccinate their own people, right? This is a crime and it's completely unnecessary and it's underpinned by the logic that underpinned colonialism. So I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but I'm saying that in the context of a conversation about reparations, we have an opportunity to really remake the world and to say, actually, that system in which we said that all of those people were disposable, in which their humanity didn't matter, their resources didn't matter, in which they can just grow one crop forever and then import their stuff expensively from us, that system has to change. 
So I put it to you that we would pay reparations. Yes, there's compensation due for specific harms and specific acts. Yes, we can restore objects to their rightful uh, places of uh, heritage. And yes, we can repair relationships with apologies and symbols of repair. But we can go further. We can transform this world and think instead of killing our planet and holding on to what aboutery and what about the Ottomans and what about the Mongols, we can say, look, the way we organize the world is messed up. It's messed up because we've got this hierarchy and we can do something about that. So I would urge you all to vote for the proposition to pay reparations. Thank you.